So I'd like to welcome Susan Gibbons up to the stage. Um, we may have a slide that shows her. I'm not going to do an introduction because it's in your uh, program, but I'm just going to leave the stage to Susan and give her this temperamental green button that you have to give a really good whack it if you want work, to change just slides. Bang it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. Thank you for hanging on there in spite of the weather to uh, stay for this talk. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is aligning library services with researcher needs and talk about methods to do that. But what I want to say up front is that while my examples are applying this method of study to library users, we borrowed this methodology from Xerox Park, Zero, uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, where they were studying users of their technologies. And I've seen um, it be used in many other uh, uh, environments, including some publishers have started creating these user research departments to understand the users of their content and think about different services. So I'm applying it rather narrowly, but the methods have been used quite broadly. So let's get started. Um, library challenges, just a small sampling that you all know about. Economic constraints, shifting things are going on. Um, so how can libraries stay aligned with the changing needs of our users and that pace of change accelerates year over year? Before I jump into alignment of libraries with users, though, I want to encourage the librarians who are in this room to also think about the alignment of their library with their universities. Um, it makes, um, it is the right thing to do, um, and it, it aligns nicely with the, the sense of if you need resources, you want to make sure that your organization is seen as crucial to your institution. And so, in, in addition to thinking about dissemination of information and preservation of knowledge, what else can you be doing to assist your university? So I try to go into my meetings with my president and provost thinking about what's on their mind and how the library might assist. Some examples that we do at Yale, uh, student retention. How can we ensure that our students stay on and get to degree? Uh, at Yale, every incoming student is assigned a personal librarian. So there is an adult who makes connection with them within their first week of coming to campus, and that librarian is there to help them and introduce them to the library rather than wait for them to raise their hand and say they need help. Uh, mental wellness is a problem, certainly in the United States, and I don't think it's limited to the United States, where the issues of mental health are increasing on campus. Um, at Yale, what the library's been doing is hosting um, study breaks during exam periods. We have game nights, anything to help the students de-stress, all the way to bringing in therapy dogs during exam periods, so you can check out a therapy dog out of the library. Uh, student and faculty recruitment is quite important, and often the library's facilities and the jewels and its collections can be used to help um, seal the deal. So to make yourself available and make your collections and your, your library available um, as that recruitment process is happening. And the last example would be around fundraising, which we do in the US, United States a great deal more, I believe, than here. But um, with every fundraising opportunity, there's an opportunity for the library to assist. Not to get, library f get money for the library, but for the library to help be part of this larger picture as to why your dollars should be given to that university. But let's turn back to library users. And often our tools for understanding what our users need a range around here. It could be usage data. We look at what is being used in our collections. But what we can't see from that is where did our users go outside of our collections to solve those information problems. So all we're seeing there is a slice. We can use surveys. Um, and I'm sure on all of our campuses, we do a lot of use of surveys. However, the surveys presume you know what the questions are. And if it's multiple choices, you know what the answers are. So again, you're getting a small, uh, narrow uh, bit of data coming back. Often we're designing um, our services around the squeaky wheel. Those who complain the most um, or have the loudest voice in the room can drive our decision making rather than grind, grounding it in uh, information and data. And lastly, this is the one that bothers me the most and I hear it the most often, when we're in a library, uh, librarians gathering together and we're trying to solve a problem, I have banned the phrase with, that you cannot start a phrase with, well, when I was at university, this is what I did. To presume that our 
experiences at university are in any way applicable to today's students um, is, is a, it's a falsity, and we have to sort of quickly break away from that and keep going back and testing. So what could we be doing differently? What we did at the University of Rochester, which is where I was at before Yale, back in 2003, we had learned from Xerox Park about their practice of taking a social scientist and having that social scientist go into different work environments and study the work practices and understand how work was getting done and then ask the question, what could Xerox do? What could it build? What could it create that might improve that work environment? So what we decided to do was test this and bring an anthropologist into the library, uh, Dr. Nancy Foster. She's a trained anthropologist. She did her field work in Brazil. And we asked her to come into the library and help us to use methods of anthropology and ethnography to conduct in-depth studies of our library users. And by in-depth, I mean some of these studies took us two years to complete. The work started in 2003. Both Nancy and I have continued this work, uh, I bringing it to Yale, and Nancy as a consultant. So for 15 years, this work has been going on at libraries across the United States as well as around the world. So let me explain briefly how this works. It's a pretty simple research cycle, one you would expect. But I stress that when it comes to the methods, you need to use more than one. You're essentially trying to triangulate your findings across multiple methods. Again, why, why a survey might not be sufficient. And then I'll say the last piece here is change is the hardest part of this research cycle. And I would argue that you cannot go through this process. You cannot ask your users to uh, devote time and help you in this process if you cannot demonstrate change at the end of it. So you might be able to get away with this two, three times, but after that, if you aren't showing change, your users are going to walk away and say, why am I bothering? So the change becomes the hardest part. Keep going. So examples of research questions that we've worked with, how do students write their research papers? By that I mean, we know they are assigned a research paper, we know they hand it in. In between is this black box of activity. We want to understand what was in that black box. What are barriers to dissertation or thesis completion? There was a report at Yale that showed humanities students' time to dissertation was getting longer, and the number of students who were withdrawing was getting larger. What was going on there? And there was an example of a university problem, not a library problem, but we wanted to understand it to see if the library might have something to contribute to help with what was going on. We want to understand how science libraries, the physical library itself, was being used in an age where most of the information was being received electronically. What role should a physical library collection play in an undergraduate library? We're studying this right now at Yale. And you should, as you can imagine, the students have a very different opinion than the research faculty, particularly in the humanities. And we're at great conflict right now trying to resolve it, but are using the study method as a way to depersonalize it and try to look at the data. Another example is design of space, and whenever we do a renovation, we try to use studies like this to help to drive the, those kinds of physical changes in our libraries. So some examples of research methods. Uh, design charrette is one where we bring uh, users in. We have them draw spaces for us, idealize spaces in the library, and then from that do an interview so that we understand the different elements of what they put into their design and they understand the why. And through that, you find some very interesting information about how they wish to use your library space, if only it were slightly different. Uh, photo elicitation is another way. When we first started in 2003, we were handing out uh, disposable cameras. You don't need to do that anymore because everyone has a camera in their pocket. But we would give lists of things to take pictures of. Uh, the top two are places that you most uh, prefer to study. The bottom one is a picture of a place in the library where you feel lost. Um, so you can elicit from your users different information about how they see the physical spaces around them. Or the ones on the top, once at the time the, the photos were developed back in that day, we would sit down and do an interview. Why do you prefer to study here? There's books on the shelf. Why did you choose to check those books out? And have a robust conversation about what is present in these photographs. Observations are a way to validate um, statements about how I would use the space versus how I actually do. 
And so observations are um, analyzing different times of day, the same place in your library, different days of week, to understand what you're seeing and to mark down what you're seeing. So how many students are there, for example? Are they using laptops? Are there books? Um, are they with friends or studying alone? Are they, uh, do they have food and drink with them? Those kinds of observations over a great period of time gives you a sense of different times of day and use. Reply cards are when you leave on uh, each chair in your library uh, a card that asks several questions. It, why did you choose this seat to study in? If you weren't able to study here, where would you study on campus? Are you here by yourself? Are you here with friends? So it's another way to elicit this information. Academic diaries were another method where we would um, work with students and ask them to literally keep a diary throughout the day. What were the activities that they did? Where did they go on campus? What were the classes that they attended? Who did they work with? What tools did they use? What time of day did these things happen? The map on the bottom accompanies one of those diaries where the student kept track of his, his or her movement across campus and what time of day. So you start to see patterns of buildings that they frequent more often and it causes you to go look at those buildings to see what is it about the quality of that space that causes them to want to study there. The exercise on the top was to take a campus map, invite students to pick a color, their most favorite color, and color the places on campus, circle the places on campus that they most like to study in. Take your least favorite color and circle the places that you do not wish to study in or do not feel welcome in. Then from that leads to a set of questions about the quality of those spaces. Why is it, in fact, that you did not feel comfortable in that part of campus? There's a black circle at the bottom. This, tends, this is actually uh, for the University of Rochester where the fraternity quad was, and this was a female respondent. So it was an issue of safety uh, on that part of campus. We also did uh, very extensive in-situ interviews. So we asked researchers and students to invite us into the place that they do their work. It could be their labs, it could be their offices, it could be their apartments. And we would do an extensive interview that talked to them not only about their work, academic work practices, but asked them about all the artifacts that were around them. So the professor above, we went through all the paper that is on his desk, and why is it there? What's in the filing cabinet be behind him? When did he choose to print out an article versus keep it electronically? We asked him to introduce us to his computer. What tools were on that computer? What software did he use? Um, so by the end of it, we understood the environment that he worked in, the tools that he used, um, and got a much richer understanding than if we just asked him some set questions. Below is a student, and we interviewed her in her, she was a PhD student, we interviewed her in her apartment, and again, we were questioning about the books on the shelf. When did she choose to check out a book versus purchase a book? What made her decide that she needed to own it and have it on her shelf? When did she print things out? What were the tools that she used? Similar types of questions. Then the last method I'll, I'll explain, and, and this is just a sampling of the methods, was about retrospective interviews. So if we go back to that question of what does a student do between the time that they, a paper was assigned and when they um, submitted that paper, what was in that black box? We worked with several students so that within minutes of handing in their paper, they sat down with us and, and did an interview where they relived that whole experience. And the drawings are artifacts that go with that interview transcript that I, shows that progress from the very top, you might be able to see a, a student talking to a professor, and at the very bottom, uh, he hands in his paper with a couple extra copies because he wishes to um, submit it for competition. The research at the bottom is a two-year research, a senior thesis. There's a flight to Washington, D.C., and all sorts of things that are included there. These were incredibly rich artifacts for us to study. And in a moment, I'll give you an example of something unexpected that we learned from them. So those are just some examples of the methods that were used um, that helped us to uh, understand better what was going on. So now let me give you some examples of the misalignments that we discovered through this process, as well as some opportunities for new services or new ways to do things. The first one was uh, institutional repositories. So uh, the University of Rochester was one of the first institutions to install DSpace as an institutional repository back in 2002. 
Um, we had talked to our faculty, they, they seemed excited about it. We put in a ton of effort to bring up a DSpace repository, and then nothing happened. No one made any deposits into it, or one or two from the side. It wasn't this rush that we had expected. So where have we gone wrong? And our study was to figure out where is this misalignment? The first thing we under, came to understand was uh, the name is completely wrong, institutional repository, institution repository. Um, as we heard yesterday with Maria Bond, the idea that faculty or researchers wish to communicate with others within their institution was quite low. They wish to communicate with those in their discipline or their sub-discipline. So to put a, an article within an institutional repository did not make sense to them. They wanted their article to be in the company of, even in the virtual company of, articles that are related by peers within their discipline. And so it was that tension between a subject repository and an institutional repository that we were coming up against. A lot of the uh, early uh, descriptions about the benefits of an institutional repository talked about metadata. And while we all appreciate the importance of metadata, it just flew right over their heads. They did not understand why we were excited about the metadata or why they should be asked to create that metadata in some cases. Um, more of the advertisement about institutional repositories focused on digital preservation. Deposit it here so that your article or your preprint will have a longer life. But for too many of them, they didn't understand that they were at risk. Unless their computer had crashed, the, the threat of uh, loss of a digital file was sort of unknown to them, and they just assumed the university had some magical system behind the scenes that was going to save them. So it's only when the experience lost that they understand the, the advantage of digital preservation. And lastly, and this came out very, very clearly, and we heard it in some of the other presentations, it takes too much time. And so what we learned, a hard lesson learned, was anything or any time that we asked the researchers to do something that would take additional time out of their day was not appreciated to the point of almost being resentful. And yet we thought about institutional repositories as self-archiving, that they would want to self-archive, but we hadn't taken into account the time that that would take, and that time was blocking them from doing that self-archiving. The opportunity that emerged, though, was as we talked to our researchers, we learned that they did have a very, very pressing need, and that was for a document management system. And in fact, in some cases, they misunderstood institutional repository to in fact be that document management system where they could have versioning, where they could co-author. The things that Google Docs do for us today, back in 2003 and 2004, weren't readily available. That's what they were craving. Instead, we were giving them a repository for that final completed document. And as Mark pointed out, that tension between what is complete and what is still um, in evolution was what we were hitting up against. Another example, as we studied uh, graduate students to understand why that time to dissertation was getting longer. We would interview them to really understand what was their process. And what we heard over and over again, the pattern that came out, was a bump in the road that many of them experienced when they left Yale in order to do research somewhere else in the world. And sometimes, for many of us, it would, it's almost um, humorous what would happen. They would, for example, save up their money, fly to Italy in August, and knock on the door of an archive and expect it to be open, not understanding that, in fact, many things shut down in August throughout Europe. They would show up at a repository or at an uh, archive or at a library without a letter of introduction and not really realizing that they needed such a thing. They would show up and want to take pictures of the, of the uh, manuscripts that they were working with when, in fact, they had to pay a high price to have it photo duplicated or something by the archive itself. What we came to realize is that at Yale, we had spoiled them rotten so that when they went out into the world, they were not prepared. Any of you here can show up at our rare book library and manuscript archive at, um, at Yale, the Beinecke, show a license or a passport, and that's it. You're in, you can work with our collections, no questions asked. And so this is how our students have been trained. And they assumed the rest of the world sort of worked like that. And we're surprised when it didn't. And so what would often happen is that first trip abroad, or even in the United States, was disastrous. They got very little done, had to come back, 
save up their money, and try again. And the second time they were prepared, and the second time they were ready. So we started a program of Know Before You Go. We give workshops on what does it mean to go um, do research at the Library of Congress, the British Library, to come and, and do research at the Bodleian. We ask to be that individual who can make those connections, who can give you that letter of introduction, who can prepare you for what you're about to experience. Ms. Alimus, we Mark and I had similar photos here. Um, we used to, this is at Rochester, we used to do library orientation. And for those of you who are librarians, you might have that opportunity. The students arrive on campus and you're given 20 minutes between maybe the athletic facilities or the, or the local bank or the health center. You're given 20 minutes to, to explain why it is that libraries are important to these students. And the timing for this is completely wrong. What's going through their minds are, is this the right place for me? Is this the right university? Um, am I going to get along with my roommate? Should I have broken up with my boyfriend before I came to university? Those are the questions in their mind in those first couple days. It is not about what is the library going to offer me and how can I make most use of those resources. So we abandoned freshman orientation, but we needed to come up with an alternative. So let's go back to those drawings. What we saw as a weird pattern, I'll admit it, it's strange, in these drawings was mom and dad would show up. How do you do your research paper? They would explain the process, and in the, the one that's in red, the individual then called mom and said, what do you think about this? In the black is an excerpt from another one where the person emailed their paper to their father, and their father gave them uh, advice on that paper. We never asked in these interviews, what role did your mother or father play? But what we were seeing are the early evidence of helicopter parents that definitely is a U.S. thing, and I think it's not just limited to the United States, where if you're a second or third or fourth generation student going to college, you rely on your parents early on for some advice. And because technology allows you to email um, a paper to your parent in the way that we couldn't when we were in college with the payphone at the end of the hall, that communication stays there. So what we did with this is we abandoned the orientation program for students, and instead we asked the university if we could host a breakfast for the parents. Because the university had a problem. The parents were driving their students to campus, and they dropping them off, and then they wouldn't leave. They would hang around. And the universities across the United States were having to create these orientation programs for the parents to separate them from the students so that the students could go off and do what they needed to do. And the parents would be separated over here, and eventually they'd say, it's time to go and push them off campus. So we saw that problem. We said, we'll take them. We want them. And we would have a breakfast for them. All the librarians would show up. We'd explain the services of the library. We'd reinforce that every class had a librarian. And when their son or daughter called them with a question, pass it along. Pass that knowledge along to them at the point of need, not you know, in that orientation. There was also a lot of tissue boxes necessary because there was this um, you know, bonding experience and parents very upset about that, that break in their life. And, and we were the adults who tried to comfort them to say it's going to be just fine. It's very interesting. Um, some emerging needs. This uh, deals with graduate students. So we were doing extensive interviews with faculty, um, trying to understand what makes an A paper in different disciplines. And early in the interview, we would ask questions about um, what are the research skills you expected a graduating senior to have? And they would articulate that. Far later in the interview, we would say, what are the research skills you expect an incoming graduate student to have? And they would articulate those. And you'd line those two things up, and they were completely different. The graduate student should have greater skills, even an incoming graduate student, should have greater skills than the graduating senior. Okay, reality is, for many of these students, excuse me, this is a, a, a summer. I graduate, I go to the beach or something, and then at the end of uh, come September, I go on to graduate school. I do not spend the summer increasing my, my library research skills. Yet there is a presumption of what we call this magical summer where you presume that that student coming in is somehow has greater skill set than the one who just graduated. So there's not much we could do about that other than to, you know, talk a little bit to faculty and, and question that. But what we did do was alert our graduate students of this myth of the magical summer and to make them aware that it's out there and that we are here to help. 
we will be these quiet partners for you that when you hit that experience where there's an assumption you know more than you do, your librarian is here to help, and we're not gonna ask any questions, we're not gonna ridicule you at all. Um, we understand what just happened to you because we saw it in our research that this was going on. Um, lastly, uh, another emerging need. Uh, we've been doing some studies at, at Yale to understand how we can do a redesign of our undergraduate library. In the 15 years I've been doing this across many different universities, um, what we saw over and over again as a need of space was for group study space. And this research that we just are finishing up right now is the first time where I've seen the pendulum swing back. And it, it, this is the first time what we saw from the students is I need more individual study space, which is quite different than everything we've seen up to now. Now, I should have said this earlier, and I'll, and I'll say it now. Please borrow the methods, but do not borrow the findings. These are findings that are unique to the community that we're studying. So this may be unique to Yale. Um, I don't quite see why, because we have a lot of individual study space there. So there's something strange that's happening, and it almost feels like, as we try to tease it out, this sense of the world is absolutely overwhelming, I'm being hit by social media, I have all these kinds of inputs, and I want a place in the library where I can go, whether it's a study carol or a little study room, I want a place to go where I can start to shut all of that out. And the first thing I need is sort of the physical blinders that help me from the visual distractions that are around me. So I don't, as I say, don't, don't assume this is what's happening elsewhere, but there seems to be a bit of a shift coming back in the other direction where much of what we had heard over the last 15 years was a, a push towards more group study space. Okay, so recognizing that we don't just have librarians in the room, I wanted to take a step back and think about what is it we, I can say about student use of content? And much of this will probably not be a surprise to you at all. Um, there is a very limited use of the library's native interfaces or publisher's native interfaces. They are going to Google, and wherever Google takes them is where they're going to land. So anything you can do to get your citations and, and your links into Google is going to help you because even if they have a known um, citation, they know this article exists, they're not going to try to figure out which database it's in, Google's going to lead them there. If they have a topic that they want to research, they're going to start with Google and Google's going to take them somewhere. So what can you do? What can we all do collectively to get our quality content into that pathway? Because trying to get them to change those practices are very hard. The other thing we see is strong brand loyalty when they get early success. What I mean by that is a student who's a freshman, has a paper due, and she learns about JSTOR. And she uses JSTOR and she gets a good grade on the paper. From that point on, JSTOR is going to be like, I'm going to keep going back to JSTOR. JSTOR worked for me, I'm going to try it again and again and again. Because to be able to discern, at Yale we have more than 800 databases and, and, um, databases, and then I don't know how many e-journals behind that. To get them to discern the differences between all of those is absolutely impossible. They are overwhelmed by it all. So what they're looking for is an early win, it's success, that's my hammer, everything's a nail, and I'll keep at it until I fail. And when I fail, then I'm gonna take the step back to figure out what just happened. Unless there's failure, I'm just gonna keep going. And we see that over and over again. By the time they become graduate students, clearly they've, they've learned different ways. We see a continued de decline in the use of the physical collection. So at Yale, that means we are about 350,000 books circulated last year, where we have close to 20 million downloads of articles or book chapters. So it's, the difference is exceptionally um, huge. Where we see a difference in that trend is a renewed interest in special collections. And whether this is just at Yale or elsewhere, I do not know. But Again, I, I'm connecting it through the comments I'm hearing from students and from faculty to that sense of I need to reconnect with the physical. That it's actually um, an inspiring uh, experience to hold the physical primary source object. And from that, teaching becomes a different experience. And so what we've done at Yale is all of our special collections units now have classrooms. And in the Beinecke, which is our main rare book and special collections library, we host over 600 class sessions a year, 
and there's a demand for more because that idea of I, I want to touch the physical and it's a qualitatively different experience, educational experience, if those pri physical primary source documents are introduced. Digitized ones are great, but there's something else there and that need is growing. So there's some trend that we're starting to see at least on our campus. As you would expect, our students have zero tolerance for any resistance in their pathways. So digital rights management, where yes, you can download chapter three and you can print seven pages, but you can't get access to this or that, it makes absolutely no sense to them. So they hit a barrier like that and they go to, um, what is it called, Sci-Hub? Sci, I'm not supposed to say that probably, but that's where they go. They look for the pirated examples of it because, and it's not because they don't have access to it. They have the access. It is that there are barriers, they do not have time, they don't want to figure it out, they're not going to log in off campus, they're not going to do this, 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 and this. Go try Sci-Hub and find out if it's there. And if it's there, that's going to solve the problem. So if we are concerned about this, we really need to think about what that experience is in, in engaging and how you get access to those collections. And the lack of standards leads to significant confusion. And that's why I've you know, put these images here. I pulled them from different databases. They're all essentially saying the same thing to a user, which is you get access to this thing that this icon is next to. You get access to this article. But why is one yellow and one is green and the lock is open to the left, the lock is open to the right, sometimes it's a green check mark. We use all of these different, we, all these different symbols are being used to say essentially the same thing. They are located all over the places in the different interfaces. I don't think anyone picks the interface or picks the product based on iconography. Why can't we standardize at least on these things? This is not the, 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 the competitive edge. I have better iconography than my competitor's uh, database. So what can be done to standardize this so that the learning curve for a student to go from one database to the other is lessened? Otherwise, go back to what I said before, they'll stick with what worked first and foremost. I know it, I understand it, I'm not going to learn these other ones. So if we can standardize on a couple of these areas, simple iconography, we can probably make quite a bit of progress there. So lastly, I want to touch on um, university presses. I'm in a unique, it's, it's not unique, I'm in a situation at Yale where I am the university librarian, I'm also deputy provost and the university library reports up to me. And increasingly in the United States, we're starting to see this coupling of university presses and university libraries at a high level. Um, and it is interesting because often we can be competitors. Um, so at Yale University Press, very large press, um, it, it is what's good for the press is often higher prices, what's good for the library is lower prices. But what we've tried to do is say, if we are partners at this institution, what can we do together that will benefit our institution and our users rather than think of ourselves as being on different sides? Um, so I'll give you some quick examples. At the University of Chicago, the library provides the cataloging and, and publication work for the press. They don't outsource it. They just rely on the metadata experts in the library to provide that. We within, at Yale, we're working with the uh, press, the library is working with the press, um, on a new art portal that they're trying to create. And in order to push this art portal out and have libraries adopt it, they need robust mark records. Rather than outsource that, they're partnering with the library and the library will create those mark records for them. Um, also at Yale, we have uh, a situation, and I don't think it's unique to Yale University Press, where is, where in their, um, They've been around for quite a long time. They don't have a full inventory of all their publications. They don't have all the books that they've ever published running a shelf. They don't have an archive. The library has served as their archive for them. So as they go to look at uh, digitization projects where they want to put more of their books into JSTOR, they don't actually have the physical books to digitize to make that possible. It's the library who's providing it. So we're partnering there to figure out how can we get more content into JSTOR and things like that. We can do it together by we provide the actual books for digitization. We've also explored some co-publication projects. 
Um, an example, a very positive example, is if you look at uh, the top selling books for Yale University Press last year, one was a facsimile of the Voynich Manuscript, which is this bizarre thing. Uh, that maybe was created in the 1400s, no one's really sure about it. It's a mystery, and there's rarely a day goes by where someone doesn't contact us to say that they've deciphered the code of the Voynich Manuscript. It drives us nuts. But rather than have people knock on the door of the library every single day saying, I, I want to see the Voynich, we worked with the press, and the press published a facsimile to size and uh, published a series of essays and it's become a bestseller with 40,000 uh, copies sold and more coming. There are opportunities for special collections and, and li uh, within libraries and presses to come together and think about ways that we can um, both work towards getting our collections out there. Another example is at Yale, the library is in an odd position where we um, are the sponsors of a, a literary prize called the Wyndham Campbell Prize. And each year, nine authors from around the English-speaking world who win the prize are awarded $160,000. It's 10 times a Pulitzer. Um, and we just started this six years ago through uh, a gift that came to us. And we started uh, having a keynote speaker come as we hand out the prizes. Those keynote speakers have included Zadie Smith, Patty Smith, Carl Ove Knosgaard. And each of them we asked to speak on the question of why I write. We quickly went to the press and said, we've got these great speakers coming. They're going to be talking about why I write. And so what happens now is the press partners with them to turn that speech into a small um, publication. And then after 10 years, we'll have these anthologies of why I write. So it's thinking about the opportunities where things that are happening in the library could benefit the pre press and vice versa. And the obvious ones are author talks in the library. If an if a author's coming to campus to meet with their editor, can we not provide space in the library to have an author talk on campus? So all of that is to say that there's opportunities for that alignment with our users, with our presses, with our institutions, and to find those study methods that allows us to go deep and figure those out. So I want to leave you with more information because there, if you're interested in this, there are several publications that have come out that will explain those methods in much greater detail that will give you examples, case studies of them. Um, and I created a tiny URL, URL there that will lead you to a Google Doc that has the citations for many of them. And the other thing to do is, is do a search on uh, Dr. Nancy Foster. She's continued this work for 15 years, working with institutions all over, including uh, Cambridge here in the UK. And so anytime you see her name attached to something, these kinds of methods are going on. And it may be focused on design of space. It may be a focus on design of services, of um, uh, a design of a, a new digital um, presence on the web, whatever it is. Underneath that, if Nancy's name is attached, these kinds of methods were, were used and employed to try to shape and align it with what was really needed by users. So with that, I will uh, step away and turn it back to Mark, who I believe has some final uh, messages for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. That was absolutely terrific. Tremendous way to end the conference. So I just have a couple of um, tiny things to, to do, and then we can to break pretty much exactly on time, which is perfect. Um, so, um, first thing to say is it doesn't end here or now. Um, so, Scholarly Social, which is an informal social gathering of scholarly publishing people, is taking place this evening uh, by design. And it's in the pub just around the corner. If you look at the map, configure it out. Um, and is starting at five, rather startling 5.45, apparently. So, uh, uh, get there as soon as you can. Is that right? To, can that really be right, Bernie? Anyway. Straight after this, get to the pub. Why not? Excellent. So that's, that's the next thing on the agenda. Um, crucial information, um, despite what Susan says about the pointlessness of surveys, um, could you please fill in your survey so that we can take action based on the information that you provide. But seriously, it is super important, and we do take action on, on what you tell us. Uh, and then last but not least, um, we are planning to do this again, amazingly. Um, and we plan to do that uh, sort of this time next year, which I think is the 25th and 26th of February. So thank you all very much and see you next year.